Welcome to the very first LDS Mission Cast. I am host and producer of the show, Nick Galletti, and I want to welcome you to what I hope to be an educational, entertaining, and inspirational experience for those preparing to serve a mission, those coming home from a mission, or anyone who's a member missionary. We have scheduled a variety of guests on a number of important topics relating to missionary work. We have upcoming guests that are post-mission presidents, LDS scholars, and even some public figures or influencers. While we're starting out with a podcast, we will be bringing online our YouTube channel with some fun and some practical content, as well as our blog. My co-host for the LDS Mission Cast is Kelsey Edwards, who is super busy right now with her music career, YouTube channel, and acting in a number of films, including some LDS films. So she'll be here for our future episodes. The LDS Mission Cast is made up of a number of different segments that we will rotate through from time to time just to keep things fresh and fun. For this episode, we'll have our first missionary news segment. Later, after our first interview, we will have a special clip from the Latter-day Lives podcast with Sean Rapier. Each week, Latter-day Lives podcast interviews some great members of the church with wonderful stories. Sean records a special side interview with his guests that focus just on their missionary experiences. And for this one, we'll hear from LDS actor Joel Bishop, who talks about some great stories from his mission to Germany. Following the Latter-day Lives clip, we will finish the show with our Book of Mormon challenge, and more on that later. For now, time for the news. This story comes from KSL.com and actually originates with the church itself. Headline reads, LDS Church Creates Five New Missions, Merges 19, Including Logan meaning Logan, Utah. Salt Lake City, the number of LDS missions around the world will shrink from 421 to 407 after the creation of five new missions and the boundary realignments of 19 missions in July 2018. This according to the statement from The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints on Thursday. So the Utah Logan mission will be merged with adjoining missions. It's the only mission in Utah to experience any changes. Adjustments to mission boundaries are common, the church said. Since the change in ages for missionary service in 2012, the church has created 76 new missions to accommodate an initial surge of growth. The number of missionaries grew from 58,000 to 88,000, but has since receded to about 68,000 missionaries, a loss the church said it expected. Fewer missionaries means the church needs fewer missions, but also a heightened importance of more strategic placement of missionaries in areas of need around the world, the church said. We want missionaries to be in the best possible place and position to help people, whether through sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ or community service, said Elder Brent H. Nielsen, Executive Director of the Missionary Department and LGS Church 70. So here's the five missions that are going to open in July 2018. Rio de Janeiro South, Ivory Coast, Nigerian Ibadan, Philippines Cabanatuan, and Zimbabwe, Bulawayo. Now, I am sure I slaughtered some of those names, but you'll have to forgive me. Anyway, we'll put a link to the rest of this article at the posting for this episode at ldsmissioncast.com. My wife and I were able to go to a special screening of one of the last stories of the Meet the Mormons film franchise. We met up with Blair True, the writer, director, and producer of the series, Jenna Kim Jones, who's a stand-up comedian and narrator for the series, as well as the star of the featurette, Danny Sorensen, who is otherwise known as The Craftsman. So here it is, our first interview on the LDS Mission Cast. All right, we are here with our very special guests, special because they are our very first guests for the LDS Mission Cast. We have Blair True, who is the writer and director of Meet the Mormons and a few other church videos that we'll get into later. We have Jenna Kim Jones, who is the host slash, I don't know, guide for Meet the Mormons. (laughs) And then we have Danny Sorensen, who is the featured Mormon, if you will, from this latest Meet the Mormons vignette. So welcome, guys. Thank you for being on. Great to be here. Very appreciative. So let's uh, let's start in that kind of order. Um, Blair, you've been kind of involved with church videos for quite some time. It's been a while. Yeah. In fact, I wanted to ask you specifically about the called to serve video. Oh my word. That's 
That was mid eighteen or nineteen eighties. Yeah, it feels like eighteen yeah, something. Eighteen nineties. <laughs> <laughs> they were chiseling stones. I knew you were uh, older than me. Uh, yeah, it was ninety. F- when was that? It had to have been eighties, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, it was late eighties, actually. Yeah, yeah it, well, I think it the was. people in it looked very eighties. Yeah, I think it was like eighty six, eighty seven. Yeah. How how early in your career was that one? I was pretty fresh off the boat at yeah. that point. I mean, I'd been. I had graduated and had gone and you know, left for fame and fortune, which, of course, did not come. In Hollywood, I worked at Disney for a while and, and uh, you know, was working there and then came back and directed that for uh, the missionary department. Yeah. It was, a, it was a documentary, so it didn't have a, a script. So in many regards, it was kind of like Meet the Mormons, I guess. We just followed missionaries around. It kind of felt the same way in a very yeah. different time, but yeah. 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 And actually, it was really funny for me because I decided to go back and watch it. It's been a while. But I realized that that had a lot of um, impact on my perception of what a mission really was going to be. Well, good. I mean, the whole point, I mean, that, as I recall, the focus of that was to help um, young boys like 12 to 16 consider at an earlier age and start thinking about missions. Yeah. And start preparing and start thinking, I wonder what missionary life is like. What am I going to be dealing with when I get out there? Yeah. And uh, so if that's what you were feeling... Bravo. Yeah. That's great. Uh, yeah, I think so. And, and we want them to come away with like, hey, I'd like to go. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, well, it didn't I hurt my to, chances, that's for sure. Yeah, I don't want to I didn't look me. at it that way. But uh, So you've been producing and writing and directing these Meet the Mormon segments, and I'm curious, now that we transition over to Jenna, how was Jenna chosen as the voice, the narrator, if you will? Well, is that for her or for me? You Both. Know, you, you, you start. First. Yeah, well. you start. I love hearing it, so you start. No, <laughs> <laughs> Well, aside from the fact that she's gorgeous and beautiful mm. and all that. Okay. Oh, wow. Well, there's just a really great... It, it, the thing that attracted us to Jen in the first place was that she just has this really fun, very approachable, girl-next-door quality. And when you see her on the screen, that really is who she is. I mean, she's... You know, I'm, I don't mean to embarrass her here, but she's she's just, <laughs> just approachable. She's her. sweet. Okay. She's I need it. cute as can be, and she's just... People love to talk to her. And if you walked up to her in the street and you saw her smile at you, you know, wouldn't you want to talk to her? You know, so uh, when I learned a little bit about her, uh, that she had done some stand up, and, and I was looking for somebody that would be really good to walk around the streets of New York and approach people and ask them a simple question. You know, what do you know about the Mormons, if anything? And, and be able to banter back and forth with them in a very non threatening way. And so we were looking for that right person. I think I had seen a spot that was done on Jenna on the, uh, was it the I Am Mormon mm-hmm. campaign? Yeah. And so well, I saw that. that. Okay. Mm-hmm. That came out well before that. Yeah, so I'd mm-hmm. seen that, and then I went and watched her do stand-up, and then I went down. She was working at The Daily Show at the time with Jon Stewart, and we we went and had some pizza or something. Yeah. We talked, yeah. and uh, I just asked her about, you know, things, and we got to talking, and I just felt like we ought to seriously consider having her be the person that asks these questions of New Yorkers as they pass left and right. And not get confused with Elizabeth Smart in the meantime. Oh, exactly. <laughs> All the time, you guys. All the time. It could be worse because she's, she's such a sweetheart. Oh, she's lovely. Yeah. Yeah, I have no problem with someone. it. Yeah. Absolutely. She's like, to me, an inspiration. But yeah. I always feel bad for... It's really a letdown for everyone else is the problem. <laughs> the, oh. oh. Oh, you're not her. Never mind. <laughs> so this project comes to you. Yes. The, the Meet the Mormons project. And... Your history is you came from, you were born in Korea. I have a, yeah, I kind of have a weird life. I grew up in Korea till I was about eight and then moved to Utah. And I then did school here, went to high school. And when I graduated from high school, I left and went to New York City at 18 and went to school out there and then ended up working in TV. I My first job, well, actually... Technically, my first job out of college was at The Daily Show. There were about there was like a month when I was very unemployed and didn't have a lot of money, so I did work at J. Crew for about a week nice. until The Daily Show called me. I had to do something. <laughs> um, so they called me and hired me, and I ended up working there and loved it, and it was such a unique experience. I started doing stand-up there. People at the show didn't really know what to think of me as far as I'm a Mormon comedian who works at The Daily Show, which is sort of unusual anyway, and who 
has these values and standards, and I don't think a lot of people knew it to make me so much so that they used to tease me that I was sort of like a unicorn in the office. They nice. didn't really believe I existed, but <laughs> they liked having me around. So, <laughs> but I, yeah, so that's kind of my background just in a really short little. Yeah. Uh, when I met Blair, I hadn't even I had met my husband yet. And since the, since meeting him, I met my husband around the same time I got married. I've had two kids. I've made a couple cross country moves. So I'm actually not even in New York anymore. Right. But I've gotten to sort of tag along on this project and do these help. I feel like I get to help tell the story in a really small way. And it's kind of a cool honor for me. I, I, I'm excited to be part of it. And every time Blair's called with a new story, I'm just so pumped and amped. So, hey, we're coming. Let's yeah, do this. Yeah, I just love it. And we've spent a lot of time together now. So I really, I love Blair and I look up to him and it's been a really cool experience. Very cool. How did they find out you were Mormon? Did you... Like, wear a t-shirt? At the show? (laughs) Oh, well, when you work in TV, it is like, you kind of live in TV. Um, They know you, you, our hours were long, and you just kind of get to know your coworkers really well. And it, I mean, it came out very naturally as far as, I never cursed, which was unusual. And at one point, (laughs) my job was to actually time code all the swear words on the show, which there were quite a few. (laughs) And so I would write down these swear words, but I would write down an alternate word. And so all my coworkers would start like, whoa, what's this word? You know, and like I would, (laughs) because I just was so adamant, like, that's not who I am. I'm not going to say those words. I'm not, I love working here. I love you guys. You know, I, I just can't participate in that aspect of it, but So they all knew that I was different, and so it came out very quickly. And then, of course, at the time when I was working at Daily Show, Mitt Romney was running for president, which was a very um, intense time. And I have to say there were a lot of kind of crazy moments where I was, like, explaining who Moroni was because they would go, (laughs) who's this Moroni that's in your Book of Mormon? He sounds Italian. (laughs) (laughs) So I had a lot of cool experiences that I think helped actually prepare me for Meet the Mormons and to feel so comfortable with my faith among people who didn't know anything about it. That was important. That mm-hmm. was an absolutely important dimension. That yeah, kind of came out in our early discussions. Mm-hmm. Okay, she can relate with with people. Yeah. yeah, well, and New Yorkers, which right. are their own breed. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. very cool. Mm-hmm. Well, I have some more questions later, but we're going to switch over to Danny now, who is arguably the star of this. I, I say arguably because there's a point in the story that I think your daughter almost. Barely steals the show. I, I think that Jennifer's story is what makes the whole story valuable. I mean, it's, you know, the, air, the airplane's story. kind of a lead in, but I think Jennifer's story is what is, is the key to it. It is. So I got to watch a showing of it last night. So I have to admit that it's going to be a little difficult to tell your story without telling your story. Yeah, I don't want to <laughs> so, give away too much here. <laughs> so we're, we're going to try and walk that line a little bit and tell some stuff that maybe doesn't come out as strongly. You are... Amongst other things, and the the main arc, I guess you could say, has to do with your love of flying. Yes. Being a pilot. Yes. When did that start? The love of flying started when I was, I don't know, as far back as I can remember, four or five years old. Uh, My dad was a pilot in the Navy, enlisted in the Navy to to be a fighter pilot during World War II. And I didn't fly much after the war because my mother didn't like it. And then he got back into it in 1964 when I was 14. So I got to start flying with my dad as he would fly on business trips or just taking the family for a ride. And I uh, got to handle the airplane a lot, and then I started flying lessons when I was 17. Wow. And I uh, got my license at 18. I read somewhere that you were able to pick up a certain maneuver, a slow roll of some kind, by yeah. reading a magazine article. Yeah, yeah, there was a magazine article. I don't remember the exact magazine, but one of the very popular air show pilots of the day had written, and it had the little diagrams that showed you where to where to put the control stick and the rudders and the elevators and ailerons. And, and so I read that, and I used to, I worked down at Sky Park. I was a line boy down there, which means I gassed up airplanes and swept the hangar and emptied the trash and cleaned the toilet and stuff like that. So uh, I read this magazine, and after work, at 8 o'clock, when we closed the airport down, I would go out and sit in an airplane, and I would close my eyes, and I would visually go through this maneuver, and I did that hundreds of times. And then one day... Uh, I talked a friend of mine into going up with me. I said, let's do this. And we went up, and I, I was able to pull it off. And the slow roll is uh, is a key to to just about every other aerobatic maneuver. Oh, okay. And if you can figure the slow roll out, the rest of them are going to come pretty easy. 
and I figured it out, and I didn't kill myself. <laughs> or, the, so or your passenger. To, yeah, or my passenger. So. <laughs> Yeah. No one fell out. Well, that's pretty cool. Um, we went through the the story last night, and I went into it not having any kind of preconceived notions as to what the story was because I hadn't really heard much other than a pilot. But one of the big things that changed your life was becoming a fireman, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. So the, the piloting business wasn't as lucrative as you were hoping? Nobody makes a full-time living as an air. There, there might be, you might count on two hands, maybe not even all your fingers. The number of people that survive as uh, full-time air show pilots. Uh, all of those guys are airline pilots and doctors and dentists and advertising agents, and they've all got something else that they do. Yeah. And as a kid, I didn't know that. You know, I thought, geez, you make this much money doing that for fun. And, <laughs> you know, but I didn't really have the investment that it would take in equipment. You know, you're a dumb kid. You don't know anything about uh, uh, all the backstory of what everybody does. And so, yeah, that wasn't just wasn't going to be a reality. So I took a job with Salt Lake City Fire Department in 1985, and and did that for almost 31 years. Yeah, which w- turned out to be the absolute perfect career for me. I'm not a desk guy. I worked at a desk in a, at a construction company doing estimating for four years before that. And the eight weeks of recruit school was the toughest eight weeks I've ever had in my life. And it was also the most fun that I had ever had in the last 15 or 16 years. Yeah. I really loved that job. It was just tremendous. Well, now, I, I originally, when I heard that you were uh, a, essentially a daredevil pilot of sorts, I mean, you, you're doing all these crazy stunts. You're not the airline pilot that's just right. trying to get there smooth. You're all over the place. And then you're a firefighter. I got the impression that you were a bit of an adrenaline junkie. Perhaps. And so when I saw the film and I saw you going backwards up the fireman pole and all this stuff, I was like, man, this guy's just got so much energy and, and vitality. Uh, not, not an adrenaline junkie at all. <laughs> okay. uh, in fact, quite the opposite. Everything that I have done in my flying, I have tried to do as safely as I possibly could. Oh, sure. When uh, other of my friends were out just breaking the rules and flying under bridges and power lines and stuff, I wasn't doing that. Not that I wasn't doing aerobatics down low as a teenager. I was, but but I've always been very careful about that and uh, and tried to calculate every risk that I was going to take. And I've done the same thing in uh, in the firefighting. Yeah. Uh, you you also built your own plane. Well, two of them. I did. Yes. But the one that you currently have is the one that's shown for the most part in in the feature. I got to say, I, it's not a very common thing for people to just up and build a plane. It's a very rare thing. About uh, Especially largely by themselves. Yeah, yeah. About 11 or 12% of the entire general aviation fleet in the United States is home-built airplanes. Really? But I would say 99% of those are built from kits. Okay. And uh, the percentage that, of people that design and build their own airplanes is just it's so rare today and it's vanishing People aren't interested in that. They're not interested in, in the amount of work that it takes to prepare to, to make your own drawings. Even if you buy plans, nobody nobody uh, builds other than from a kit. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's very rare, but it's the only way. I just I don't see myself ever building a kit. It's cheating to me. <laughs> I mean, there, I mean, I've got a lot of friends who build airplanes out of I kits. I can't even build a kit. And they've built beautiful, beautiful airplanes. But for me, for Danny Sorensen, that's cheating. I like I like to design and build it myself. You see, I can't even build a model airplane. Probably, <laughs> I can't build a model anymore. <laughs> one of the parallels that you tell in the story, I think, is really quite beautiful, and I'd love it if if we could give one last tease on the story of of how building the plane helped you kind of feel more closer to God, or to understand His role in a different way. Well, God is the great Creator. He created everything, and and here on Earth we create things. You know, we create families and, and children and grandchildren that are, you know, our progeny that goes on down. And I think God wants us to be creators. He wants us to learn how to create. Not that everybody needs to build anything, but we need to create some beautiful lives and, and uh, raise our children with a belief in God and understanding the nature of God and, and how he relates to everything we do. God is interested in the, in the most minute detail of our lives. I mean, many times I went down to the hangar with to work on that airplane, and I had problems that just vexed me for one, one problem I had for two weeks, and I just could not figure out how to answer this problem. And I went to the hangar one day, and I said, 
Heavenly Father, what am I going to do about this? And the answer came into my head so instant, and I went, whap, slapped myself on the forehead. And why didn't I think of that before? And, and that happened so many times where I would lose something if Jennifer didn't find it. Uh, yeah. I, would, I would pray, and I'd say, Heavenly Father, this little thing doesn't mean very much in the overall scheme of things, but right now, this is very important to me. Would you please help me find it? And boom, you know, sometimes it was the next day. Sometimes it was in 20 seconds. I had it in my hand. Yeah. And it was just amazing. So, and then, and then to relate that all of, all of everything that that airplane is built of came out of God's creation, the trees that grew to make the wood and the, and the, the ore that was mined to make the steel and the aluminum and the rubber for the tires, all of that comes out of nature. I just It blows my mind that nature creates the kind of stuff that we can build something like that. You think about an airliner, goodness sakes, that Huge. is a complex piece of machinery. Yeah. And uh, I never get on an airliner, but what I'm not, I, I see the hand of God on, on any airplane. I get in the air, I see the hand of God in everything. I really do. And I also thank Jimmy Doolittle for inventing instrument flying. So that those airliners can go where they the do in those distances and yeah. those speeds yeah. and get us where we need to go. Yeah. And so, Blair, you you are both a pilot, far mm -hmm. far less experienced from what oh, I gather. I, I'm not even on the scale compared to Danny. I'm just, I mean, I have a little <laughs> card that says I'm a pilot, you know, and I've got some time and you know, I've flown around a little bit, done some cross countries and been flying for about 15 years. But Danny's a pilot. Yeah. I just go from point A to point B. <laughs> So I, I, I couldn't help but want to ask this question. Is Elder Uchtdorf like your favorite apostle because you're <laughs> pilots? Do you just get some more of his analogies than, than the average? Well, I, I don't know if we're supposed to have favorites, but, you know, I'll tell you, <laughs> he's certainly up there. And I love listening to his stories. And I think along the same lines of what Danny just said, I think when you, you know something a little bit more about a topic, you appreciate it more. And so, yeah, when he shares those stories, they, they have a little more meaning for me. Yeah. And, and I've, I can think of so many things that are analogous to life and the gospel of Jesus Christ as it relates to piloting an aircraft. And I love him when he comes out with those. And I've got, you know, I'm sure Danny has a ton of them. Uh, I've got a few of my own. So we yeah. could go on all day about that. But. Well, I wanted to kind of get a peek, if we could, into maybe your favorite scene that didn't make the cut. Is there hmm. something that didn't make it and, and what? Well, there is a sequence. It was one of the last to be cut out. There's a, there's a whole lot. When, you, when you're shooting a documentary film, you have a lot of ideas going in. You have only so many days in which to work because every, every person that you, you bring into the project and equipment that you bring to bear in a project costs X amount of money. And so you're trying to pack as many different thematic elements as you can without doing so many that you do harm to all of them because you're trying to underscore everything. Right. But there was a section where that's not in the film. So, hey, we're not going to spoil this one because it's not in the film. <laughs> where, where Danny has a big tree in his front yard. And it's been the family tree. It's been in the, in the yard. How long has that tree we, been? We there? moved in, in in 76, and the tree was planted in 53. So how, wow. how big did it grow when, be, right before you guys decided it was time to... It, it had lived its full mature life, and it was beginning to rot. And, it was about two and a half feet in diameter through the central part of the trunk. So it's a big tree, and, and the idea that Danny's son was Tyler. Tyler. Right? Mm -hmm. So they cut this tree. Ty Tyler thought that he could, hey, Dad, if I, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Danny, but Dad, can I have the wood in this tree? And I'll, I'll go ahead and pay to have it cut down, and I'll, I'll take it out, and we'll clean up the hole, clean up the yard. And it was only supposed to be like a two- or three-week project. Yep. Two years later, <laughs> it still hadn't been complete. So when we arrived at Danny's house to film, the, one of the first questions that I had for Danny was, tell me about this tree. <laughs> Because it was a, it had, it was a big gaping hole in the front yard, and so, but I just love the whole idea of, of, yeah, it didn't go as planned, and Tyler, Danny's son, had taken the material from this tree and created some wonderful, like a chair. I mean, we're talking really high level yeah, craftsmanship, beautiful chairs, wooden toys, that have come back into full use in the family. So there's, there's part of the family was in that tree when it was a living thing, and now it resides still with the family in, in form of another object. Yeah. You know, and you, you talk about, Danny talks about, you know, he crafted the wood, uh, shaped and crafted the, the wood in the wings. And those, came, what type of wood was the that? Sitka spruce, which yeah. is a very, very tall, straight growing, mm. straight grain tree. And so I just love the whole idea that, that Danny had passed along this idea of craftsmanship to his children. 
And that was a key player in the story right up until it wasn't. <laughs> right up until we cut it out because of just time. You know, we, yeah. the story's 22 minutes long, and they're really supposed to be more like 20, but we extended it for because it was so good, and those flying sequences are so fun. But So that was one of the things that didn't make the cut. Yeah. Well, it reinforces the title of it, right? Yeah. The Craftsman. Yeah. And, and that theme is definitely felt in different ways, and, and so that's, that's great. Uh, did you have one? Did you have a story that they filmed? Uh, well, and got you cut? know what? It all ran together for me. <laughs> the whole thing was an out of body experience, and I don't have a clue what they've got and what they don't. And all I saw <laughs> was, is what's on the. I mean, we sat there in uh, Lynn and my and my wife. You know, my wife. We sat in our living room and had a four hour interview. I think it was from ten to two, and. They've used, I don't know, maybe... You're talking about the interview? Yeah, 45 yeah. seconds of that interview. Is in, in, you know, <laughs> there's so much. Yeah. They just can't get it all in. So I, I couldn't say, but, I, you know, all of the flying was, was just wonderful to go out and film. I love formation flying. And the stuff that we did with Barry, the other pilot that you see near the end, was just so fun. And Barry contacted me, and he wants to get together and do some formation work, so... Great. I'm looking forward to that. I want to ride in the back seat. Yeah. (laughs) Or front seat. Front seat. How are you feeling about this, I guess, virgining fame that's kind of coming out of this project? There's no fame here for me. It's, uh, you know, Alain said she thinks this is is our mission. You know, we're uh, with with Jennifer. We're not going to be able to do a full-time mission like we had planned on when our kids were Young, it's just it's yeah. just not going to happen, and so this is just our mission to to help spread the gospel, and uh, and even if we don't spread the gospel, spread um, a love for families and and children, and and raising kids to be accountable and good citizens. And that's awesome. So yeah, we kind of teased the whole Jennifer story a little bit. I, I'm almost curious if we can even go into it at all without giving some of it away. Well, it'd probably be good to. Just, just say it's worth. Yeah, it's, it's worth to see. It's worth, worth the price of admission. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so what? Where is this going to be shown? Well, initially it's shown. It opens uh, tomorrow, Saturday, uh, in the Legacy Theater, and it's a it's it like its predecessors are, is a standalone story. So it's in rotation with the other stories. You know, the coach, the humanitarian, the missionary mom, the fight. You know, all those stories. How many we have? Eleven, twelve of them now, and and they're in rotation. This one's going to be playing more frequently throughout the day because it's newer, mm-hmm. and people now are interested in seeing the newer stories. So it plays, I think, four or five times throughout the day in the, within the rotation of stories in the Legacy Theater, downtown Temple Square, in the Joseph Smith Memorial Building, the old Hotel Utah. Uh, and that's where all the, you know, the big films that the church has produced, that's where they've traditionally played over the last you know, 20-something right. years. And then it will go from there uh, in the coming week or two, it will then be made available uh, on a paper, not pay per view, but on a uh, on demand. <laughs> That'd be fun, pay per view in <laughs> a <you> church uh, <laughs> church run facility. But no, it's on demand, so they can go into any other visitor center. So Washington D.C. or Los Angeles or anywhere there's a, a temple visitor center. This film will be in rotation or be available to be played on kind of an on demand basis in Got those it. venues in English only initially in the coming weeks. And I'm not sure, I, I want to say, typically they like to get them out in, in, in a week or two from when they play in the Legacy. It just takes a while to get the technology out of the other theaters. Sure. What kind of impact has this had on missionary efforts, the whole Meet the Mormons franchise? Boy, that's, that's a really tough question because it's so difficult to quantify. We hear all kinds of stories, all kinds, hundreds of stories from missionaries who were working with someone and they just... They felt, you know, if I can show them one sequence or if I show them the original Meet the Mormons, they missionaries as well as members have learned that it's, it's a great non-threatening way to introduce somebody to who we are, what makes us tick. And, and, it's, and like I said, it's non-threatening. It's kind of like, like Jenna, you know, she's, she's approachable, she's non-threatening. <laughs> and so it's, it's uh, that's, and, and all the stories, I mean, the, by design, the whole purpose of Meet the Mormons is to give members a tool to use with their non-member friends mm-hmm. yeah. and not feel like, so they don't feel like they're being preached to. Who wants to be preached to? And I, I mean, it works. <laughs> I mean, I, I have a lot of friends who are not members of the church who went to see this movie because I, you know, I said, oh, I'm, I'm in it. You should go watch it. It's going to be, you know, it's really fun. It's really interesting. There's so many cool stories. And I have friends who come to me and say, you know, the, the candy bomber story just, 
have rocked my world. I had no yeah. idea that it's that really was fun a because because nobody has a. I mean, people have a favorite. Everybody has a favorite. Right. 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 But there is not one story that's an outstanding favorite. Right. And we had hoped that they would all be on a par with each other, so that we would feel like there's a little something from ev- for everybody. And in certain areas of the country, the bishop oh, is the favorite. Yeah. Other areas. Yeah. Yeah. Other households, the, it's the candy bomber. Other, it's oh, it's the Navy coach by we, far. Right, Others, it's right. and and now some people came up to me last night who'd seen all the stories, and it was gratifying to say, "What's your favorite?" And they say, "Oh, I love the Craftsman." <laughs> and so our goal has been from the outset to make sure that because we set the bar kind of high on the original stories, there's high, pretty good production value and they're pretty epic in nature. Mm-hmm. And we just said whatever we produce, we want to just make sure that they, that the new stories are at least as good as the originals. Mm-hmm. Now that's for other people to decide if they're as good. Sure. But the but the anecdotal evidence that we're getting is that they actually like the new stories better. Now I think a lot of that, in fairness, is because they're new. Right. But I think it's safe to say that they are at least as good as the originals. Oh, definitely, definitely. Yeah. I mean I've had friends who who will let missionaries in their home now because they saw the movie. No. Oh. Because they feel comfortable, because they go oh, well, I know I can just invite him in, give him some water and talk to him, and I know what you guys are and, and what that it's means. It's non-threatening. And, yeah, and, and I, I do think that the mission of the movie really worked. I, I you know, genuinely it, do, yeah. It, this Hopefully this goes to your question, but initially when the first movie came out, it was not intended to be released in theaters. It was going to be released in the Legacy Theater and other visitor center theaters. Okay. But a firm in Los Angeles who was cutting the trailer for us after the movie was pretty much locked up and pretty much done, they also test movies, and they said, you know, this is really good. And, I, and I was, of course, I'm, well, you're being very kind. You're working for us, so you're going to say it's good. No, no, seriously. I mean, our, our, our whole staff has watched this movie, and they cry, and they love it. Oh, that's nice, and I still kind of, you know, maybe they just think we're soft-hearted, and, you know, we're Mormons, <laughs> so they got to be nice to us. And, and, and I, I think they could sense that I was still kind of writing off their, you know, in a self-deprecating way. Well, that's nice, but, you know, but you guys do the big Hollywood movies. And they said, you need to release this theatrically. And I, in essence, said, are you nuts? This is a religious documentary. People are not going to pay money yeah. to see this movie. They said they will, and we should test it. And they convinced us to test it and let them do the testing. And what was interesting is they tested it in eight different markets, major markets throughout the United States. These are paid audience screenings. So somebody approaches you in a shopping mall and says, hey, do you want to participate in a focus group in a new movie? Yeah. And th- so they take it out there. So you think, well, people are going to say nice things about a movie when you just paid me 100 bucks to watch it, right? Mm, I don't know about that. But what happens is they, what they do is that gets them into the theater, and they usually do 60 to 100 people to, to test the movie. And then they watch the movie, and then they have the option at the end of the movie to walk out. Actually, they have the option to walk out after five minutes if they want. Oh. And in eight different markets, we had zero walkouts. And that just That's kind of unbelievable. That yeah. doesn't yeah. happen. That doesn't happen, <laughs> especially for a documentary. It doesn't yeah. right. a religious. And so the numbers. So we did focus group, and and people in these focus groups were saying things literally like, you know, I was really rude to these missionaries just last week. They mm-hmm. came to my door, and I feel so bad. I I hope they come back because I would never do that. I'm going to let them in. And I mean, they were saying things that we could have couldn't have scripted them mm-hmm. to say any better. And we almost didn't. We brought these comments back to Salt Lake, and we played them. And the brother looked at them, and they said, well. Let's release it theatrically. Yeah. And didn't it say something? I think there was part of her narration at the beginning said something about it being the top 35. Yeah. We say, we say 35 just to be safe because, you know, it's always going to change a little bit. It's yeah. actually in the top 30. Okay. But, um, yeah, in, the, in, the, in its opening weekend, it was in the top 10 in all categories. I mean, it was number one documentary, of course, but, I mean, it was in the top 10 and it was released against all the other big movies of the day and remained there for a few weeks. And then within three weeks, it had climbed to, to number 30 on the all-time highest-grossing documentary. documentary. And that's that's out of half a million documentaries that have made yeah. since the it's late... Like, it's like Justin Bieber, a couple other pop stars, Meet the Mormons. Yeah, it's it's really, very, it's really, it's really, it's really bizarre. bizarre. <laughs> yeah, it really is. Kind of an anom- <laughs> it's probably the number one religious. <laughs> or in the top yeah, five. I mean, yeah. Possibly, yeah. Yeah. And it was a it was a really it kind of developed a life of its own by the time it was into week three and four. And yeah. of course all the proceeds. The church isn't in the movie business, so all right. the proceeds after of course the exhibitors were paid and, and right. all that marketing costs uh, went to the American Red Cross. So they donated that. Oh, money. I didn't know that. Yeah. Very cool. So it was fun to be there when they handed that big check to those guys. Yeah. Very yeah. cool. Yeah. And Danny, you're now part of that. I Welcome guess so. to the family. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It's part of the family. Yeah. 
Well, thank you guys for coming in and talking about it. And we want to encourage everybody to go out and see it where they can. Um, is There's a website, though, that they can go and get more information about it. Yes. there. If, if you nav- navigate to the Temple Square webpage, um, you might have to dig a little bit. But uh, I'm not sure if it's through LDS.org, but I think you can navigate to the Temple Square okay. webpage. And then you can find Legacy Theater, and it'll have the show times. Okay. Beyond that, I know that they've set up pages for the individual theaters out there. Okay. And and you just have to nav- find your way, you know, just do a Google search and find it that way. I believe there's a, a Meet the Mormons Facebook page or, and or a website like too, meetthemormons.com. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. So we'll put links to that for the posting for this episode at ldsmissioncast.com. Yeah. Again, thank you guys for coming in all three of you and best of luck with the release. Thanks. Thank, thank you. you. Good to be here. We hope you enjoyed that interview and make sure to go check out the latest story for the Meet the Mormons. It really is a great experience for yourself, but also a great missionary opportunity as well. So don't just go, take a friend. Now, as Sean would say in the Latter-day Lives podcast, sit back, relax, and enjoy our next conversation. Hello, this is Sean Rapier with the Latter-day Lives podcast, and I am sitting here with actor extraordinaire, Joel Bishop. Joel, hello. Hey, Sean. So, Joel, you served a mission. Uh, What years did you serve? I served from 1989 to 1991. I guess I'm old. Yeah, I guess that makes you old at this point. But that was me too. So, um, where uh, where did you serve your mission? I served in Hamburg, Germany. So, the Germany-Hamburg mission. Yeah, what, what cities did that kind of include? What are the major cities of that mission? So, it included the northern part of West Germany. So, at the time, Germany was still split. Uh, f- southernmost part of our mission was Kassel, and it went. We had Hannover and Hamburg, and we also had West Berlin, which was an island at that point over in East Germany. How amazing to be in West Berlin at that time! Yeah, yeah really cool. So everybody has some funny experiences from their mission. Did you have any experiences that were were a little funny from your mission? Yeah. Well, so this is hopefully this is humorous to others. Um, I, I met, uh, there was a sister missionary there that was I was serving with in Berlin, and um, we served in the, our companionship, my companionship, and her companionship served in both the English-speaking uh, war, the servicemen's ward, as well as the German branch. Oh, yeah. And so we, we worked together quite a bit. But in district meetings, um, she's from Chicago, I'm from the Milwaukee area, and those two cities kind of have a rivalry, don't <laughs> care for each other. And we were in district meetings. We'd just be very, very sarcastic to the point where the the other missionaries in the district would keep track. Oh, Elder Bishop has got a point, and oh, Sister MacArthur has a point. And anyway, <laughs> so it's kind of a inter- interesting thing there. Well, at a mission reunion years later, um, we were sitting at a table, and um, and one of my old companions was next to me, and. Um, uh, former Sister MacArthur was sitting next to me, and we were we were talking for a while. And finally, I had to get up and leave, and I kissed Sister MacArthur on the mouth because she was my wife at that point. <laughs> and and this elder lost it. He's like, "What? You guys are married?" <laughs> because of the experience he'd had when we were uh, companions, and we just were so kind of silly and sarcastic. So. I met my wife on my mission. That was a great blessing. It was, yeah. it was unexpected. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it's really cool to have that, those, the common experience of another language and another experience. And, and to be in Berlin when the wall came down. You were in Berlin when the wall came down. We were in down. Berlin when the wall came down. Incredible. And so we, we both got to experience that, which is a great thing to share. And that's something that you guys share now in your marriage. Yeah. I would yeah. love to see that missionary, that ex-missionary's face, though, as you lean over and kiss her, like, why is Elder Bishop kissing Sister MacArthur? Yeah, it, I think he lost. He just And he didn't pick up on the conversation, I guess, during that time. Very that, funny. That we were a couple. Now, of course, all missionaries have spiritual experiences on their missions. Is there one that stands out from your mission? One of the, uh, one of the I guess, biggest experiences, this was just a neat experience. I had an opportunity to be a district leader in an area, and as such, had the opportunity to deliver a baptismal interview to one of the um, to to a woman who had been taught by another companionship, and so this woman happened to be from Romania, hmm. and the area I was serving in, which was um, this is in 
Uh, oh no, Braunsch Braunschweig. Braunschweig. Yep. Yeah. Um, like and there were having to be a lot of uh, political refugees from all over the world there. Anyway, <clears throat> I had been teaching a lot of people uh, that were from Romania and, and learning a bit of Romanian. And when I did this interview, I had another woman in the room who spoke both German and Romanian, and she would translate my questions from German to Romanian to this woman. But when this woman replied back in Romanian, I didn't need a translator. I understood really? everything she said. Now, I can remember two or three words now of Romanian, and that's it. And I never learned the language, really. But it was a definite, one of those blessings that you hear about, the, the gift of tongues, that I, I was able to pick up the German language, but I was able to pick up enough of the Romanian and have that blessing to understand yeah. it. And Romanian is very different from German. I mean, those are two very different languages. Yeah, uh, Romanian is a romantic language, and, yeah. and German... <laughs> you would, German is the least German's, romantic language. <laughs> um, so, yeah, no, very, very different. And uh, it, was, it was just one of those spiritual moments for me to know that I was being protected in my calling um, as district leader in doing this sacred interview, and just to be able to understand things, not just by the Spirit but um, through other gifts as well. Wow. That is an incredible story. That is a great blessing to be able... A lot of times I think we think of the gift of tongues as being this really big thing, like it's being translated through. But sometimes spirit to spirit, we can understand each other. And that's incredible. Yeah. Joel, thank you so much for sharing this mission experience with us. We appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you. We will put a link to the full interview with Sean and Joel at the posting for this episode at ldsmissioncast.com. You should check it out. It's a wonderful interview. Now on to the Book of Mormon Challenge, which is a, a combination of a couple of ideas. First, some of you might have been in church where they challenged someone in the quorum or auxiliary to hand out a copy of the Book of Mormon that week and then report on it the next week. And some of you might also remember the ice bucket challenge where people would dump a bucket of ice cold water on their heads and then publicly challenge someone else to do the same. We're going to combine these sorts of ideas in our Book of Mormon challenge. So I'll start things off. I commit myself to hand out a copy of the Book of Mormon and then I will report back next episode on how that went. Then I will commit someone else to do the same. And then the week following that, we'll see how their experience went and We'll see how far around the world this whole challenge can go. And that's all part of helping to flood the earth with the Book of Mormon and, and to help the missionary effort along. So stay tuned for next week for great interviews as well as tips on how to prepare or be a better disciple-centered missionary. Make sure to subscribe to our podcast in iTunes or your favorite podcast format. If you don't find us right away, give it a day or two. New podcasts take a little bit of time to populate across these various platforms. But when you do find us there, please leave a rating and a comment. The more and better ratings and comments we get, the higher we appear in the podcast listings. So help us get the message out about the podcast. And I'm also so excited about the guests that we have planned. I promise you will learn great things, have a great time, and be inspired at the same time. This again is Nick Galetti for Kelsey Edwards and the rest of our effort here at the LDS Mission Cast. Thanks for listening. Mm-hmm.